Hello everyone and welcome back to the Jamsy Online YouTube channel. As you may already be aware, we have a 1968 4.2 liter Jaguar engine here in the shop for machine work. And today we're going to be diving head first into the cylinder head which has seen better days. On our initial inspection, we found that the valves and valve seats were substantially worn and the valve guides were worn out as well. As such, the head will be getting a complete valve job and the first step in that process is to thoroughly clean the cylinder head. In order to do this, we'll first be removing all of the plugs for the coolant passages. The threaded plugs on the top of the head unscrewed with the impact, while the flat freeze plugs on the side of the head were removed by drilling a hole in the center and using a slide hammer to pull the plug. With all the plugs removed, the head can be ran through our small spray cabinet for an initial wash to remove the majority of the oil and grime. After being rinsed thoroughly and dried completely, the head goes into our blast cabinet where glass beads are used to abrasively clean the chambers, ports, and water jackets. Now a huge part of being able to do our work on this head is being able to fixture the head rigidly, ideally on a rollover fixture which allows us to do machining on the top, bottom, and sides of the head, but given it's a unique shape, the pre-built fixtures simply won't work. As such, I set out to design and fabricate a fixture plate which could be bolted to the head and then adapted to the rollover fixtures on each of the machines that we use for valve guide and seat work. Knowing the tools and material that I had available to me, I opted for a design using three quarter inch thick steel plates which would be welded to angle iron for rigidity and have the hole pattern drilled for the head bolt holes as well as the hole pattern drilled for our rollover fixtures. With our CAD models drawn, I hopped over to the other shop and cut out three plates that were the rough outside dimensions needed. And finally, I get to introduce to you the newest machine addition to our shop, a Wazer desktop water jet machine. We've teamed up with Wazer, who were gracious enough to sponsor us and get us set up with this new addition to our shop that's going to come in handy with so many great projects in our future videos. To get started here, we're filling the abrasive hopper with Garnet Water Jet Abrasive, which will be mixed with a high pressure water feed to accurately cut our material. From our design files, I've simply saved a DXF file for each plate, which has the outline of the outside edge I would like to be cut, as well as the locations of the hole patterns where I want Wazer to simply pierce the material. The files are imported into the Wazer software, where you can specify variables including scale and position, the material and thickness, and your desired cut quality. The software will give you the estimated cut times and abrasive usage for each quality, and in this case, I'm opting for a medium cut quality since the outer profile isn't highly important to the function of the part, as long as it clears my tooling. I should also note here that we're cutting the maximum thickness that Wazer can cut on mild steel, which is a quarter inch. The software can then generate our job file, which is a G-code file that can be saved onto an SD card and inserted into the machine. After noting the location of our cut paths on the grid of the software, we can position our material in the corresponding location on the grid of the cut bed, which is a consumable that must be replaced periodically. The plates are screwed tight to the cut bed to prevent them from moving during the cut, and with the lid of the enclosure shut, we can begin the cut. Unlike many industrial water jet machines, the Wazer is fully enclosed, keeping the water and abrasive well contained within the machine. To begin with, the Wazer holds its position while the material is pierced, at which point it will begin following the file to cut your profiles. As the machine runs, water is constantly being circulated through the machine, and the used abrasive is being collected into buckets at the front of the machine. After one hour of cut time, the machine will pause and allow you to refill the abrasive hopper and empty the used abrasive buckets. Once this has been done, you can shut the enclosure and resume the cut. Our cut lasted a little bit under three hours, so I refilled the abrasive and dumped the used abrasive twice during the cut. Aside from that, the machine runs virtually unassisted. It's probably not a good idea to leave it fully unattended, but there's no reason that you can't be running another machine across the shop, or reading a book for that matter, if you're a hobbyist working on a project in their garage. I purposely left the material a bit long, with the intention of cutting the last quarter inch of the path on the vertical bandsaw, as opposed to letting the water jet cut past the edge of the material, which is less than ideal as it can cause damage to the machine. The locations where the machine had paused for an abrasive refill left a small tab in the cut, which was easily broken apart. Overall, I was impressed with the cut quality at the medium setting, and it only required a tiny bit of cleanup to take off any sharp edges. Earlier I mentioned that I had the Wazer set to only pierce the bolt hole pattern, and by doing this, I was able to save cut time and abrasive on the Wazer, while essentially having the bolt hole location center punched, making it easy for me to accurately center up and drill them to the correct diameters. As you can see, the plates are fairly simple. They have the bolt patterns required to either bolt to the fixture or to the cylinder head, but they also have a contoured edge which keeps available clearance around the combustion chamber for our tooling. In all honesty, even before adding the angle iron, the fixture felt stable and rigid, but I would rather be safe than sorry on a head like this. With the plates still bolted to the cylinder head, I went ahead and carefully tacked everything in place with the MIG welder. 
I then removed the head in order to do some full welds on the plates without any risk of damaging the head. My dad told me that my welds were an embarrassment to the family, so he ground them to make them look halfway decent. I reminded him that this is a machine shop, not a welding shop. All in all, the fixture came together exactly as planned, and I'm sure it won't be the last time that I throw a head fixture together with the help of Wazer. While this may have looked like a lot of time and effort into a one-time fixture, it is worth it as we now have a solid way to safely fixture the head for valve seat work, valve guide work, and even to level up on the manifold side to do a little bit of thread repair. You may remember that earlier I mentioned the valve guides on this head are worn out. On the intake side, they have around 2 thousandths taper, which isn't terrible, but also isn't good. On the exhaust side, the guides are completely wiped out with more than 5 or 6 thou taper. I want to remove the old valve seats by cutting them out on the Surdy valve seat machine, but machining seats with a worn out guide is difficult as well as inaccurate as the guide quite literally guides your tooling during seat machining. The largest pilot that currently fits in the guide ends up being quite sloppy due to the taper in the guide, as the loose end of the guide allows the pilot to move, especially the farther out the pilot sits. It may be hard for you to see a difference, but it would be much better if the pilot fit tighter and had less wiggle like I'm showing here. We can achieve this by quickly taking our diamond valve guide home and opening the guide up for a larger pilot. In theory, this will allow us to get the guides much straighter, although they would now be too large to actually run in the engine. With the guides fit to a larger pilot, I fixtured the head on the rollover fixture of the Surdy valve seat machine. If you're new here, I'll give you a rundown on how the Surdy centers up to cut a seat, and all that I ask of you is that you like and subscribe. With a pilot inserted in one valve guide, we use a small bubble level and simply adjust the angle of the cylinder head until the bubble sits inside the line, at which point we lock down the fixture nice and tight. We only need to level off of one valve guide as a patented triple air float centering system of the Surdy will compensate for any discrepancies between the rest. The first planar airflow allows the head of the machine to float the pilot over to a single guide. With the pilot inserted in the guide, the second planar airflow is released, floating a much lighter weight of only the motor and the spindle, allowing the pilot to find the true center of the guide. Next, a spherical air float is released, allowing the spindle to align to the true axis of the valve guide before all of the air floats are locked down, allowing us to machine seats which are perfectly aligned and concentric to the valve guide. The process for removing the valve seats involves cutting basically the entire depth of the seat at a diameter just smaller than the outer diameter of the seat, leaving a paper-thin ring that can easily be snapped out of the seat counterbore. In this case, one of my fixed diameter counterbore cutters looked as though it would be just the right diameter, so I set it up on a tool holder and began cutting the seat with the spindle running at around 250 RPM. Despite the seat material seeming relatively soft, the cutter simply did not like to cut without chatter. I tried running coolant as a cutting aid, I tried slowing down the cutter RPM, and I even tried speeding up the cutter RPM, but the cutter always wanted to chatter unless I kept a significant amount of downward pressure on the cutter, which I didn't want to do because I didn't want to risk cutting past the bottom of the seat insert. I knew I didn't want to fight the chatter on every seat, so I decided to change over to an adjustable seat cutter with a 90 degree cutting insert, which I adjusted to just a bit larger than what I had previously cut, while still remaining at a smaller diameter than the valve seat insert. Having one single insert cutting as opposed to two cutting inserts on the fixed cutter seemed to clean up the chatter and cut smoothly, which was a relief. If I remember correctly, I ran the cutter at around 180 RPM, and at this point, it's as simple as continuing to feed the cutter down into the seat until we hear and see the cutter break through the bottom of the insert. If you do this right, the original seat counterbore remains untouched. Finally, we can get behind the edge of the seat with a small pick, and if you've cut the insert thin enough, the remaining seat will simply break right out. And here comes my supervisor, Declan. He's a little bit camera shy, but he's still a good shop dog. Of course I had to grab some slow motion footage here because it's just fun to see the chips fly on these bigger cuts. And if you're wondering why that insert holder has the word rough stamped onto it, my theory would be that the dumb kid who runs the Surdy might have crashed that insert pretty hard into a head a few months back, spreading the fork apart. And he'd managed to straighten it out, but he doesn't use it for finishing seats anymore, and I mean, that's just my theory. I was glad I filmed this one because it was kind of interesting. When I got to the bottom, instead of the bottom of the seat breaking out, the entire seat began to spin in the bore. This wouldn't be ideal if we weren't recutting the counterbores because it could potentially damage it, but in this case, the counterbores are going to be recut for a new oversized seat, so it's not a big deal. The nice thing here is that once the tooling was set for the first insert, the other five intake seats were pretty quick to remove. Here again, we have another example of why we spent the time to make this fixture because it made it extremely quick and easy to rotate the head 180 degrees on the fixture to give us a nice view for cutting the exhaust seats 
without having to look all the way across the head with it tilted the wrong direction. The process for cutting the exhaust seats is exactly the same as the intake seats. We level the head on one exhaust guide, set up a cutter to a diameter just shy of the OD of the seat insert, and cut through it until we just break through the bottom. Everything went smoothly on the exhaust side as well, but I did leave the wall of the seat a little bit thicker, so they were just a little bit tougher to get a pick behind them and break them out. Regardless, they all came out without any damage to the head, which is always the goal. With all of the seats safely removed from the head, the next step in the process was to remove all of the valve guides. This will be done on our other machine, so the head and the fixture were transferred over there. This is kind of a rough process as opposed to a finishing process, so we'll simply level the head off of the valve cover surface, which gets the guides plumb relative to the machine's spindle. Our plan is to use a driver and an air hammer to drive the guides out of the guide bores, but first we cut the top of the guide flush or close to flush with the head, which prevents breaking the guide or deforming it, which could then effectively broach the bore of the head. Sometimes on aluminum, we have to drill out the center of the guide to help relieve the press. So after cutting the top off of one, I opted to do a test run and see how easily the guide would move. With a few short taps, I could tell that we were good to go without any additional drilling, so I went ahead and cut all of the guides flush. Interestingly, the head actually has a small counterbore around the guide, which is where a surclip around the guide is supposed to seat against the head, preventing the guides from dropping. Oddly enough, the clips were only included on the intake side of this head and were never installed on the exhaust side. Our new guides will have clips on both sides. And here you can see that after cutting to the clip, I just get a pick down in there and pop it right up. The factory book for this engine recommends boiling the head in water for 30 minutes before driving the guides out, which obviously expands the aluminum more than the cast iron guide, helping relieve some of the press. We decided it wouldn't be too bad of an idea to do the same thing, so we ran the head in our spray cabinet for a quick cycle. The spray cabinet runs close to boiling temperature, and when the head came out, a laser thermometer read around 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Once again, the fixture came in handy as it supported the head up off of the surface of the teardown cart, giving enough room to drive the guides out from the top side while my dad helped hold the head steady. The intake guides came out surprisingly easy, which was a bit concerning to be honest. With all of the parts removed, we washed the head once more so that we can begin the process of measuring all of the guide bores and getting our dimensions noted and setting our tolerances for installing the new bronze guides as well as the seats, which will require larger counter bores. And don't worry, parts are arriving for the JAG block, so stay tuned for that video. If you've stuck around this long, just know that we appreciate every single one of you, and you can find us on other platforms at Jamsy Online and shop our website www.jamsyonline.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.